for the Summer Beach Read series to continue on WBSM. Every week we chat with a different author to give you a little insight into their work and their new books, something you might want to pick up to read on the beach. And Linwood Barclay is joining us this morning. Uh, the best-selling, well, best-selling thriller writers like Stephen King rave about Linwood's work, so it's got to be pretty good. Good morning, Linwood. Thanks for being with us. A pleasure. How are you today? I'm doing well, thank you. Now I understand you were a uh, you're a former columnist with the Toronto Star. So were you working in newspapers and always wanted to write a book, or how did the timeline go? Well, you know, the thing is, I was wanting to write books when I was in my teens and early twenties, and I figured when I left college, I'd just become a best selling writer. <laughs> The only problem with that is that the publishers were sending all the books back, and they didn't think they were any good. Mm. So, so I thought, mm. well, we're going to get paid money to write every day, and I went into newspapers, and I spent 30 years working in newspapers. And, uh, and I guess I got a little better at what I was doing, and about 10 years ago, the first novel came out. I was going to say, working for a newspaper like the Toronto Star must have given you plenty of uh, situations to draw from for your books. Oh, it certainly did. I mean, it's just the environment. I mean, there's nothing like working in a newspaper. And, and the Toronto Star is Canada's largest paper, and, and there was just always something happening. And, uh, and just to be part of that is, is just it's a great, it's, a, it's, a, it's not just a great place for ideas, but it's a great place for just training you how to write and how to get things done. Now, you say you always wanted to be a writer. Did you always want to write thrillers? Well, I always wanted to write mysteries and, and crime novels. I mean, I was... Uh, probably the, the, the earliest books I can remember reading are the Hardy Boys, and I went through those like crazy. And then around somewhere around grade five or six, I was reading Agatha Christie, and then I was reading the Rex Stout's Nero Wolf books when I was in about grade seven. And somewhere around the age of fifteen, I started moving up to Dashiell Hammett and Ross MacDonald and Raymond Chandler and all that kind of stuff. So it's the kind of the kind of it's the kind of material I've always been drawn to. Right. The new book is called No Safe House, and uh, this is about uh, a family uh, and their troubled past is about to catch up with them, right? So do I need to have read the first book? or You do- don't have to. It is a kind of a follow-up book to a, a novel I wrote seven years ago called No Time for Goodbye, which was a big it was kind of my breakout book. It was uh, it sold, you know, millions of copies around the globe, and 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 my when I was doing a new contract with my U.S. publisher, they they had said, "Have you ever thought of doing a sequel or going back to those characters?" And and the idea was that you know, a lot of times in thrillers, the people involved, you know, something something traumatic happens to them, and by the end of the book, they get their answers and they know what happened. And supposedly everybody goes off happily ever after. But the things that happened to these people in in the first book were so, so devastating that I thought, I wonder if they ever really recovered. And, and even though those matters were resolved in that book, I thought seven years later, what's it like for them? And, and I kind of imagined that, the, that, first of all, the, uh, the mother from the earlier book, who, who had something that happened to her as a child, would be probably the most overprotective and, and anxious mother in history. <laughs> and I wondered about her relationship with her own daughter today and what that would be like. And whether that concern for her, uh, that overprotectiveness, would kind of have the uh, be subject to the law of unintended consequence. The more you try to protect her, the more you're going to drive her away or drive her into trouble. And so that's why I wanted to come back to these characters and and look at the again and look at them again, see how they were doing. Wow, that is a great idea. I mean, you think you think it would happen more often, but it doesn't, does it? Where people go back and check on. You said seven years ago. It was seven years. That book came out originally in the fall of 2007, and uh, so I thought, well, let's go back. Because in the first novel, it's, it's very much about uh, a woman named Cynthia, who at the age of 14, her, her family disappears. And now, as we move forward, her own daughter, Grace, is the same age. She's 14 years old. So there's a kind of resonance, uh, a resonance about that, I think, that, uh, that takes place. We're talking but, to. But I'd say you don't have to have read the first book. Right. We're talking to Linwood Barkley, and that's B A R C L A Y, and his website LinwoodBarkley dot com. Now I understand that a few of your books are being one uh, has what is it? Trust Your Eyes has been optioned for film. A couple of them have. Um, Trust Your Eyes came out two years ago, and that was immediately the subject of a bidding war between Warner Brothers and Universal, and Warner Brothers got it, and they recently renewed the option on it. And uh, that, when I wrote that book, my editor called that Rain Man Meets Rear Window, and it's about a, a disturbed man who's obsessed with maps, who spends every single waking moment 
online on a Google Street View kind of site where he's able to travel the world virtually. And he spends all day going down the streets of all, you know, of all the major cities in the world and happens to see something in a window that was captured. He is one of these billions of images that was captured at the moment a, a car taking the pictures drove past on the street. And this, what's in this window appears to be a murder. Oh. And uh, so, so that's called Trust Your Eyes. And they say, I think their last I heard, they were in the third draft of the screenplay and they were looking for a director. And who knows? Maybe it might actually happen. <laughs> I, that one sounds really interesting. I, I want to go. Yeah, see I it. want to go back to that one in, in a moment. But I've heard from other writers that uh, that that's a tough process when someone it, someone takes your work and they start changing it, right? Yeah. And how well, does that? It, some some authors are not happy with this procedure. Well, most aren't. <laughs> but but that doesn't mean they don't cash the check. There you, you go. Know? They'll still cash the check. I mean, it, I, I, I'm kind of, even though n- none of my books have yet made it to the screen, although that's, I mean, Trust Your Eyes isn't the only property that's been optioned, but it's the one that's moving the most, the furthest ahead. What you have to accept that is that they're taking your book and using it as a source material to make something of their own. And a director's obligation is to make the best movie he can make, not necessarily just make the author happy. And I get that. I mean, I think, I believe it was Harlan Coben who said, the, you know, picture a, picture a massive wall or a fence, and the author goes up to it and throws his book over it, and then it waits a little while, and then the producers throw a check back over the fence, and they each go their separate ways. <laughs> and that's kind of it. And, and you know, there's really nothing you could, you just can't, yeah. I, I just don't think I can worry about that. I mean, it, I hope that, I hope people, if the movie gets made, I hope they like it. And yeah. if they like that, then maybe they'll, they'll go and look for some more of my books, and what more could I want? Now, uh, let me go back to uh, specifically Trust Your Eyes, where you said uh, that, that the guy uh, spends 24 hours a day or his, his entire day uh, on, like, a Google Maps site. Yep. Where did the inspiration, where do you draw your inspiration from? How'd you get that idea? Well, it's funny, you know, when uh, I think the initial idea for that book was friends of ours had said that if you looked up their house on Google Street View, you could see their dog's head in the window sort of watching the car go by. And I thought that was funny. And I thought, well, imagine all of the billions of snapshots that are essentially being taken as these these mapping cars go roll around the planet. I think there has to be instances where they've captured something that someone would have preferred that, you know, had not been seen. Mm-hmm. And, and that was really the, the genesis of that. And then, and then I started thinking, well, how do I make it believable that someone could find this image online? And I thought, if it's just a guy like me, thinks, oh, I think I'll go on Google Street View and look at Manhattan. Oh, there's a murder. That's what we in, publish, in publishing would call really lame. So, <laughs> so uh, I had to create a character who... Who's, who was a, a, of a personality that you could believe that he, um, of anyone, could stumble upon this image. Wow. And that's, that's kind of how that book got going. But where the ideas come from, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I find that uh, ideas just sort of, sometimes you wake up at 2 in the morning and the whole idea is there. And you think, I don't know where it came from, but I'm glad it happened. You don't question a miracle, right? <laughs> Pardon? You don't question a miracle. That's right. You think, well, you know what? I think that just might work. Yeah. I don't know where it came from. Maybe it was the pizza I ate. I just did. <laughs> <laughs> now, do you do you get up and write right away, or what is your process? Well, I'm when I'm in the thick of writing a book, I'm I'm up. I'm usually at work by about you know. I mean, I work at home. I have a study. I usually work around eight thirty and go till maybe three. I try to get about two thousand words a day done because I've spent thirty years working in newspapers. I mean, I don't. I'm not the kind of guy who's waiting for the muse to strike. Right. You know, it's it's a job. And You're used to it's a deadline. A job that I love, yeah. but people, you know, they'll ask about writer's block, and I think, well, plumbers don't get plumbers block, do they? I mean, it's <laughs> a job, and so I just sit down and get to work, and I have a certain amount that I want to get done in a day. Excellent. It's funny. I when I talk with authors, I'm always amazed by that that you could sit down and write from eight thirty to three thirty, and and that the ideas just keep flowing. Of course, I sit here and talk for four hours, so it's well, pretty see, much... Like, if I had to do what you do, I would, I would probably blow my brains out. I couldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> but there'd be a story in that. Talk show host goes well, there bazonk. There... <laughs> no, I'm just thinking 2,000 words a day that I had to write a 6,000-word uh, paper, my thesis, for senior year. That took all semester, so I can only imagine... <laughs> yeah, see, you probably had to do research. I'm just making it all up. Hey, there you go. That might be harder sometimes, though. <laughs> <laughs> now, where does the research... We're talking to... Uh, 
We're talking to Linwood Barclay about his new book, No Safe House, uh, which obviously research is involved. What what do you uh, – you must have friends you reach out to, maybe on the Toronto Force or what? Well, you know, the thing is that my – I don't write the kind of books that are about a lot of sort of forensic kind of investigation. My books uh, typically are – ordinary people who get caught up in extraordinary things. So I'm writing about people like that I know, and, mm-hmm. and I'm writing the environment, the kind of environment that I know. So there are, there are times when I do have to do some research, but not necessarily the kind that you might expect for a crime novelist. For example, I wrote a book a few years ago called Fear the Worst, in which the hero was a car salesman, and I'm almost certain it's the only thriller ever written in which the hero is a car salesman. But but you know, I sat down with a couple of friends who used who were retired car sales guys. Okay. And I said, "Tell me everything." Yeah. And so, uh, you know, I could gather a lot of information about a completely different kind of environment or, or work environment than what you might expect to get in a crime novel. And uh, and they had good stories, especially about the one who took who took the pickup truck for a test drive to deliver a load of manure. I love that story. <laughs> Oh, and returned it, I'm sure, not washed. Returned it. He left it sort of in the far corner of the lot and said, you know, it's really not for me. And then they went out to put, to put it back in the paddock, and they went, oh, that's not good. <laughs> uh, Linwood, thanks so much for being with us. The new book is called No Safe House, and uh, it's available in all the bookstores. And your website, again, linwoodbarclay.com? Yes, that's right. And I'm on Twitter, and, and i got a Facebook page, too. People can find me in lots of places. No, on the day I was born... The nurses all gathered round And they gazed in wide wonder At the joy they had found The head nurse spoke up Said leave this one alone She could tell right away That I was bad to the bone Bad to the bone Bad to the bone Bad 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 to the bone. I broke a thousand hearts before I met you. I break a thousand more, baby, before I am through. I wanna be yours, pretty baby. Yours and yours alone. I'm here to tell you, honey.